Welcome to Dialogue. Recently, the world's attention has been focused on the increasing tensions between Iran and Israel. Both the U.S. and the EU have strongly condemned Iran for its April 13th attack on Israel and voiced support for Israel by launching a series of sanctions against Iran's economy, energy and military institutions. But no condemnation was ever issued on Israel's initial strike. Russia was sanctioned for invading Ukraine, while Israel has been immune to any punishment, even after some 34,000 civilians have so far been killed because of Israel's incursion into Gaza. Why does the West maintain such completely different attitudes toward different nations and peoples? And how will this biased favoritism by the West for Israel impact the situation in the Middle East and beyond? Join us for our discussion today from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are uh, Rorich Bruckner, Professor of Political Science at Stanford University in Berlin, Rick Dunham, Visiting Scholar at Tsinghua University, and Professor Said Mohamed Morandi from the University of Tehran. Welcome to Dialogue. As we said, so, you know, we know that the tension has drawn the attention of the world between Israel and Iran. Uh, but let's go back a little bit. Uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Bruckner. Uh, we know that uh, this round of tension started in a sense uh, on April 1st when Israel bombed the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Um, but in any situ situation, I would say there will be condemnation of such an act because it's a clear violation of international law in terms of protecting foreign nations. But there's a clear lack of uh, condemnation uh, you know, from the U.S. and from other European nations. Why is that? Well, we all see what we like to see. And if we take any other conflict in the world, we distinguish between those countries and governments we feel close with and those who we think are just victims. So freedom fighters appear to be terrorists and vice versa, depending on which glasses you wear. When a partner of China attacked Ukraine, and China is very committed to the integrity of territory of sovereign states, China didn't condemn Russia either. So the situation didn't start in April, according to the ways it is read in a number of Western capitals, because they believe that Iran is supporting terrorists and Israel is facing a proxy war. And that's why Iran is an active participant in the ongoing conflict. And therefore, depending on how you tell the story, you either condemn or you don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Rick, um, you know, of course, not only Israel, but also Ecuador, we know that uh, the disputes with uh, Mexico is also about the, you know, like kind of sovereignty of the embassy, you know, protection of foreign nations. Uh, uh, people would say that's a violation of international law, protecting the uh, diplomats there, uh, you know, if it is a bombing of your embassy, of course, most of the nations will do something uh, in their justification to, you know, against such a behavior. I would say people would say that's justified. Uh, it's absolutely true. There's never any justification for an attack on an embassy, whether it goes back to uh, Tehran uh, in uh, 1979 with the uh, ho holding hostages in the U.S. embassy. Uh, or uh, the uh, NATO bombing of the Chinese embassy uh, in uh, Yugoslavia uh, during the bombing campaign during the civil wars in Yugoslavia, uh, or uh, obviously what happened in Syria with the Israeli uh, attack on uh, Iranian uh, uh, embassy. There's no justification for this. Uh, the the uh, embassies are the territory, the sovereign territory of another nation. It is against international law, period. Uh, and you can decide what the sanctions should be, uh, but there is no question it violates international law, period. An interview clip of British Foreign Secretary David Cameron has gone viral on the internet, you know, in which he condemned Iran for its attack on Israel and described Iran's action as a, quote, reckless, and a dangerous thing, end quote. Uh, but we asked what Britain would do if a hostile nation 
flattened one of Britain's consulates. He said that Britain would take very strong action. And if you look at the con comments after that uh, you know, uh, video clip, most people uh, are commenting that Cameron's remark is uh, very hypocritical and the risks of double standards. Uh, Professor Morandi, do you also see a, a practice of double standards here? Yes, it's a uh, situation that we've been living with for many decades in Iran. In the 1980s, when Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Iran with Western support, uh, but also at that time the Soviet Union was uh, close to Saddam, the United States and the European uh, allies of the United States began to provide Saddam weapons, but more importantly uh, for this discussion, uh, they provided him chemical with chemical weapons. They provided him with mustard gas, nerve a, nerve agents, and uh, the military intelligence to use them, and of course the political cover to get away with it. Uh, that is not a crime that the West will ever face repercussions for. So uh, other countries can be invaded destroyed, uh, impunitive measures can be imposed upon them, their assets can be stolen or taken for uh, much smaller claims or crimes. But uh, the sheer number of people who died as a result of the weapons of mass destruction, the chemical weapons among Iranians and Iraqis and those who were maimed for life, they, they, they are, it's very high. But never have we seen uh, the inter international law be used to uh, put people in, in Germany and on trial or elsewhere on trial to get compensation for those who've been killed uh, or, or those who are dying because their lungs uh, are gradually collapsing. And the same is true with Gaza. You, you have the uh, South African complaint, and, but we know that nothing ultimately will come of it. So the world order is based, uh, is structured in a way in which uh, the victors of the Second World War have the upper hand. Uh, they cannot be touched. Uh, they can use the use international law against other countries. But the problem, I think, is that because, as your uh, other guests rightly pointed out, we have a changing balance of power in the world, the dissatisfaction with this state of affairs where the laws benefit one side and that same side is not even abiding by those laws and demands the others to abide by them, this state of affairs cannot continue. And I think that one of the reasons why we are moving towards such an unstable uh, situation across the globe is because there's no longer a point of reference or there's no longer a body or a, a mechanism or a, a set a series of rules which all of the different sides can accept and uh, follow mm -hmm. uh, well of course you know um, that that's um, probably people would agree upon in terms of this global order you know uncertainty and uh, conflicts uh, in many parts of the world so, Rick, you know, uh, on these, uh, you know, sanctions uh, on uh, for the sanctions on Iran, you know, the economy, the the military, and also the oil uh, export. Um, do you think at the same time, if there is a concern of the effects of the sanctions, because we are facing obviously, you know, in particular, I think in the U.S. inflation, inflationary pressure, uh, whether that will cause, you know, further, uh, say, a pressure in terms of the price of oil and other uh, goods? Well, I don't think inflationary pressures in the United States will have anything to do with uh, uh, additional sanctions now. I, I don't see how it makes any sense at this point uh, to uh, add any kind of sanctions at this point uh, against Iran. I, 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 I mean, 
it isn't logical. I mean, we could debate sanctions that have been imposed in the past, but right now, uh, I, I think that the goal should be to uh, to, to limit uh, the uh, aggression in the Middle East and to try to uh, bring peace to Gaza right now and to work toward a uh, to, toward, toward a, uh, a Palestinian state, uh, not toward uh, toward toward. Uh, toward uh, tit-for-tat uh, escalation between Israel and, and Iran. And I don't see how any, uh, any further sanctions against uh, Iran would, would serve any purpose what's, whatsoever. But, I mean, right now, I, I, I don't think that, uh, that, in, that inflationary inflation issues or the price of oil will have any impact on American uh, strategy. Uh, and I, I actually do think that that policymakers in in Washington right now uh, are most interested in trying in trying to figure out what is the best way to diffuse tensions in the Middle East. I don't think that strategy number one is to isolate or overthrow the government of Iran. Mm -hmm. I do think that the number one goal right now is to figure out a way to bring peace. In the UN, of course, there's Security Council resolution about uh, the statehood of Palestine and also its full membership of the UN. Um, but uh, obviously, the US uh, cast the only veto against that resolution, despite uh, you know 12 votes in favor and uh, two abstentions. Uh, you know, Ch um, Chinese ambassador to the UN, uh, Fu Chun, expressed a deep disappointment uh, at the result. Uh, here are some of his remarks. Let's take a look. It's a sad day. Because of the U.S. veto, the Palestinian application for full membership of the United Nations was rejected, and the dream of the Palestinian people for decades was shattered. China is very disappointed with the U.S. decision. We cannot agree that the countries concerned do not support Palestine's full membership in the United Nations claiming that the Palestinian state does not have the capacity to govern itself. Many changes have taken place with regards to the situation in Palestine over the past 13 years. The most fundamental change is the continuous expansion of settlements in the West Bank. The living space of Palestine as a state has been continuously squeezed. The basis of the two-state solution has been continuously compromised. And some countries have turned a blind eye to it, acquiesced with, and even connived at relevant acts. Now they are the ones questioning that Palestine is not capable of governing. This is a gangster's logic that confuses the right and wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Rick, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but you know, what's the response um, or media response of the U.S. decision you know, to veto such a resolution calling for statehood of the Palestine and also their full membership in the UN? Well, I mean, the, the, United, the United States logic and my uh, personal belief are different. Uh, I mean, the United States logic is that there is no authority, no Palestinian authority that can govern uh, right now. And I mean, factually, that might be correct. There is no there, there's no police force. There is nothing that could uh, defend itself. But that's a self-defeating prophecy. Uh, I, mean, it, it, I, 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 my, my personal belief is that you you create a government and and then protect it. I mean, the same way Israel, United Nations created the state of Israel. Uh, I mean, the United States ratified, I should say, it did not create the state of Israel, but the United the United Nations vote. Uh, ratified the state of Israel uh, in 1948, and I think that that's what's going to have to happen. And 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 Israel could have been uh, vetoed in the United Nations, but it was not, uh, and and it, it was it was supported by a margin of three to one. Uh, and I think that's what's going to happen. Um, I, I, I do I do think that eventually uh, a Palestinian state will be approved by the United Nations, but. I do believe it will happen when there is a new government in Israel. I do not think it will happen with this current government. It may not happen with a current American government, uh, but I, I think it's inevitable personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not speaking for the United States whatsoever, but, uh, but I, I don't think it's going to happen uh, this year. I don't think it's going to happen in the current, with the current government in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Brokenham, you know, what's the response uh, 
like in the European countries. Do you think European countries also uh, hold a similar idea with the United States in terms of the Palestinian statehood here? Well, everyone I hear in Germany and in the European Union is strongly convinced that there is no alternative to a two-state solution. How to make this happen and whether it's a good idea to use the um, status of the Palestinians in the United States as a bargain chip or whether it would be a first mover to change the setting for negotiations, that's more a matter of taste and you have to ask the American government why they vetoed the position. But in the European Union, with all the cacophonic orchestra sound that it usually produces when it comes to the Middle East, everyone seems to be very convinced that there is no other way but two states. Two state solution. Uh, that's, you know, basically every country agrees upon that. Uh, uh, Professor Morandi, you know, I mean, what's the you know, response from the Middle East, the people, uh, uh, Arab country, you know, Muslim country here? You know, when the U.S. Uh, representative say, you know, said that, you know, we don't oppose to the uh, Palestinian statehood, but somehow they vetoed the Pal Palestinian statehood. Uh, you know, that's, that's a bit of, quite a contradictory there. It is, but I think that U.S. policy is obviously uh, not to have a two-state solution. That is just lip service. And the same is true with the Europeans. They are not at all honest when it comes to Israel. The purpose is to buy time. The Israeli regime has been uh, stealing land from the West Bank uh, for decades. They've been colonizing the land as we speak. During the last six months, they've killed for over 400 Palestinians in the West Bank, and they've colonized more territory. And, of course, in Gaza, we know that for years it's been under siege, that people are regularly killed in Gaza. For, for many years, they would carry out air airstrikes. They would prevent people from leaving and coming. The, the, the West, the United States, the Europeans, they always knew this, and Israel, of course, is an ethno-supremacist regime, but the Europeans and the Americans choose to pretend that it's some sort of democracy. But the point is that anger and rage builds up, and what the United States and the Europeans are doing by giving the Israeli regime full authority to continue the genocide. And we know that 50,000 to 60,000 people have already died. 30-some thousand have their bodies have been recovered. Well over 10,000 bodies are under the rubble. Many have died because of malnutrition and because of the lack, a lack of medicine. People with very difficult diseases do not have access to their medicine anymore. So the, the numbers of people who are dying are much higher than the official numbers, yet the West it closes its eyes to it, this reality. And... Uh, I have no doubt that this is going to be a major problem for the West in the years to come. And I don't think that uh, under these circumstances, uh, the Israeli regime can last uh, much longer, whether it's two years or 10 years. But after committing a genocide, no one is going to accept such a regime in West Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, whatever you call it, you know, nearly 34,000 uh, civilians, you know, uh, killed in Gaza. Of course, we also see the attacks on, uh, you know, UN people, uh, humanitarian workers, you know, hospitals, schools. Um, so, Rick, it seems, you know, many people would be puzzled. You know, look at uh, the the uh, the U.S. and the relationship with uh, with Israel or with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, it, it seems that you know, even the U.S. administration, the Biden administration, is fed up with, uh, with Netanyahu. Uh, but at the same time, people would say there's only, if there's only one country, that's the U.S., which, um, uh, will, which could wield some influence over the decision of the policy of uh, Israel. Uh, why is there, no, is there any push, if not punishment, uh, against Israeli behavior in Gaza? Well... That's an excellent question, and it may go back to my 29 years of uh, covering uh, politics in Washington. Um, it's a presidential election year, and um, the, uh, the presidential politics uh, is very sensitive. I mean, this is a close election, and while uh, Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump both dislike 
uh, Benjamin Netanyahu personally. Um, they are trying to appeal f to uh, pro-Israel voters, both Jewish voters and uh, Christian voters, and uh, they don't want to uh, turn them off. And it's a sensitive issue. And I, I think that uh, punishing Israel uh, would uh, w would be risky. And I, I think that's what it. I think that's the that's the issue right now. They don't like Benjamin Netanyahu. They definitely don't like what he is doing. He is not listening. He's not listening to what Joe Biden is saying uh, directly to him and, and, and indirectly. He's not listening to what Donald Trump is saying on his social media. Um, but they have very little control because politically, they don't want to uh, either, neither Trump nor Biden, but Biden in particular, doesn't want to take a chance of losing uh, votes uh, and risking uh, re-election. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Brooke and I, if uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, there's a political concern because uh, it's an election year. Uh, what about the European countries? Um, at least there are different voices. I know that, uh, you know, some of the countries are, you know, rather critical of the uh, Israelis, you know, policies in Gaza, but others um, remain, uh, you know, uh, supportive uh, to their policy in Gaza. Um, but still, there's a lack of any real substantial policy um, that will push the Israelis to say, do something to protect the civilians. Well, I don't know what you have in mind when you say a serious push, because there's certainly far less leverage on the European Union side compared with the relations of the United States and well, Israel. Well, I, I, let me make myself clear, Professor Broken. I'm sorry for that. Uh, you know, when they uh, when, when see there, okay, you are, the Iran launched a retaliatory attack against Israel, immediately there's, uh, there are sanctions on Iranians. And when Russia took military action against the Ukraine, immediately round and round sanctions on, on Russia. Somehow there's a lack of action on Israel. Well, the sanctions on Israel wouldn't have a similar effect compared with the complete decoupling of the European Union towards Russia when Russia attacked Ukraine, not because it was interested in stealing a chunk of the territory, but because it challenged what the European Union stands for. So this was an indirect, but a very concrete action against the European Union. This is a different situation even if we call the region in German Near East, because everything what happens there directly affects the European Union. So everything the Europeans tried to do diplomatically didn't lead to anything. There was a personal argument between Foreign Minister Baerbock and Netanyahu just a day ago, and they got loud, and it didn't lead to anything, because Israel neither needs the Europeans for weapon imports, nor is the access to the single market a leverage that stops people like Netanyahu from doing what he's doing there. There were a lot of warnings that what Israel is doing out of self-defense, which is internationally legally possible, is totally out of proportion. And the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza is the immediate consequence of this. This is what the Europeans said out loud over and over again. But there is very little in terms of economic or military leverage what the Europeans could do to stop Israel. Professor Brandy, you know, let's say a global majority uh, in, the, in the South, in the developing world, uh, people do have concern uh, in terms of the um, Ukraine situation, in terms of the Gaza situation. People do see uh, like a practice of double standards uh, to a certain degree, hypocrisy in some situation. But you know, what will this affect, uh, let's say, the global order or the image of the West or in their global standing, let's say? Well, now, you know, over the years, due to economic policies, due to their endless wars, the West has uh, be be begun, began to decline uh, in relative terms. And we have new powers on the rise. But instead of rethinking their policies, instead of trying to uh, repair their relationship 
their relationships with the rise, different rising powers, uh, the West chooses to intensify their conflicts with them. So now uh, you have in the, the West is in conflict with Russia, regardless of what one thinks about the nature of the Ukrainian war. There's no doubt that in 2014, the West supported a coup against, against an elected president. There's no doubt that the West closed its eyes to the rise of neo-Nazi groups uh, in uh, like the Azov Battalion and Right Sector and, and other C-19 and other such groups in when when it benefits the West, neo-Nazis can be used. When it benefits the West, Zionism can be used. Rick, go ahead. That was just a whole bunch of baloney and misinformation and disinformation. Uh, I, first of all, China's a rising power. Russia's a declining power. I mean, to, to conflate to conflate Russia and China is is uh, is absolute uh, disinformation uh, and uh, and uh, and to. Uh, uh, what we've what we've heard about the future of Israel, you, you could you could tell why Iran is isolated in the world from the uh, disinformation that we've heard from Tehran right there. Uh, the point is that we need to figure out a way to have an independent nation of Israel uh, next to an independent nation of Palestine. Uh, we don't need to figure out a way uh, to wipe Israel off the map, as our guest from Tehran just said. Uh, he would like to see happen in the next 10 years. Uh, we, uh, yes, there is some of a double standard uh, with the treatment of, uh, of, of uh, the war uh, caused by the invasion of uh, Russia, uh, of uh, Ukraine, and the uh, innocent victims in Don't be coward. Gaza. I did and not yet, say wipe Matt, you are lying. Don't lie. Be honest, be an uh, academic. But you like too. And, and, you yeah, come up with well, all kinds of fake news. Ethnos, well, uh, let, state. Let, please let, yeah. let, 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 let Rick continue. Let Rick continue. Uh, and, 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 and yet, at the same, at the same time, uh, it doesn't mean just because there's a double standard does not mean that aggression against innocent people in Ukraine is okay. Uh, the invasion of a sovereign nation is wrong. Uh, just like the killing of tens of thousands of innocent people in Gaza is wrong. Uh, and we need to figure out a way in both cases for Russian aggressors to be gone. We need to stop talking about Nazis in Ukraine. We need to stop uh, talking about uh, the Zionist regime uh, not existing anymore mm -hmm. in the Middle All right. East. That's uh, uh, and 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 and, and, that's and, and so I say we need to be hand. positive about the future ra rather than being divisive mm -hmm. and destructive. Let, let's try to be, um, you know, reach some sort of consensus. Uh, a, a brief response, Professor Morandi. Please keep it brief. Yes, uh, this this of course is not really a. a you are saying you are correcting uh, what you said, like a wipe off the the Israel. No, is, no, he, yeah. no he, he made it. He okay. just fabricated it. Mm. What I said that Israel, as it is, it it will cease to exist. Apartheid will end. Whether these gentlemen, this gentleman likes it or not, apartheid will come to an end. Ethno supremacism mm. will come to an end. Mm -hmm. Terminology, Amalek will come to an end, whether he likes it or not. All right. Um, with that, I think we are coming to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinzhuo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.